If I were to describe how the average Catholic looks at the world today, I'd describe it like this. Broad and wide is the way that leads to heaven, and everybody's going that way. And narrow is the door that leads to hell, and hardly anybody's going that way. But you know what? That's just the opposite of what Jesus himself tells us the situation is. Broad and wide is the way that leads to destruction, and many are traveling that way. And narrow is the door that leads to life, and few there are who are finding it. Now, Jesus didn't say this because this is how it has to be. People who are on the Broadway don't have to stay on the Broadway, and that's where we come in. That's where our prayer, that's where our love, that's where our intercession, that's where our witness comes in. We need to really invite people to leave the path that's leading to destruction and find the person of Jesus Christ who can lead them to true life here on this earth and eternal life. Hey, welcome to another week of The Choices We Face. What a delight each week to be able to be with you and share with uh, you some of the most important things that anybody could ever know. Our guest this week is Monsignor Charles Pope, and Monsignor Pope is a priest from the Archdiocese of Washington, D.C., and he's the pastor of Holy Comforter St. Cyprian Church in downtown Washington, D.C. Welcome, Monsignor Pope. Well, thank you. Great to be here. Yeah, well, I met Monsignor Pope through his blog, Monsignor Pope has a regular blog that's on the Archdiocese of Washington, D.C. website. And when I first started reading some of his things, I said, wow, somebody else is saying this stuff, too. I really felt such a, a, a kinship with, with, with what you were saying. You know, Monsignor was dealing with issues like, is there really heaven? Is there really a hell? And uh, does sin really matter? And, you know, uh, isn't fear of the Lord a good thing after all? And all that kind of stuff. So we, we began to correspond. And then I, I went to the Archdiocese of Washington priestly conv priest convocation. And we had a chance to meet personally there and other, other times as well. So great, great to have you. Tell us a little bit about your own story, you know, like your own spiritual journey and a little bit also what you're doing right now. Yeah, you know, I have come uh, to discover, I guess, just how important it is for us, especially who would preach and proclaim the gospel, to personally know and, and have met Jesus and God the Father and just know of the power of the Holy Spirit in our life. And so I was actually very privileged early in my seminary years to read a book of yours, you know, Crisis of Truth. Oh. And you, you, you really laid out again the urgency of, of coming to know the Lord and proclaiming the truth. And then Father Francis Martin was also very influential mm. for me. And in my deacon year, he preached um, uh, our deacon retreat. And again, he was fundamentally talking about what we often call baptism in the spirit, not a new baptism, but really laying hold of our baptismal vows and promises and the experience. And so I really began to uh, just relate to that powerfully so that as I, I went forth into priestly ministry, I really made an urgent sense in my own life to really, I need to come to know the Lord very, very personally. And uh, I, my, my, I guess my, my whole life began, you know, very, I, I met Jesus the day I was baptized, um, which was the day I was born, because I wasn't supposed to survive the day, but here I am. Wow, praise the Lord. And, uh, I didn't remember meeting him then, but I, I know that he powerfully related to me in those early years because and my earliest memories are, have a vivid relationship of Jesus. And I spoke and he spoke with me very vividly as a young child. But somewhere along the line that went away. You know, my father went off to the war and our life, our family kind of went into crisis and my dad came back, we moved around and I kind of went through the rebellious teenage years and so on. And I guess my journey back kind of began interestingly. I, I joined the high school choir in our parish because there are a lot of pretty girls <laughs> and, uh, and I wanted to meet the girls. So I didn't even join the choir because of a particularly spiritual, I mean, it was a Beauty, goodness, beauty, and truth. But, but uh, I think uh, uh, somewhere in, in singing and praising God, my, my, my faith came back alive. Mm. And I, um, I began to play the organ and the piano, and I began to be a cantor. And then I eventually became a choir director. And through all of that, I was studying computer science, and I was dating a girl, and I wanted to get married. But somewhere I began to hear the Lord calling me to the priesthood. And it was strange, because I didn't feel particularly spiritual. I was preferring marriage. and. Mm -hmm. But eventually, I think she must have gotten glasses or something, but she broke up with me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I said, well, this is um, a clear message. So I stopped dating and I, I began to look at, at the priesthood. And I went off to Mount St. Mary's and the rest is history. But Great. 
through it all, I had a major crisis in the mid years of my priesthood where I, I, I kind of developed a really a powerful anxiety disorder. And I, I was even hospitalized. And that was a big crisis. But that, I, I will say, in that crisis, I met Jesus very personally. I was praying one morning and there he was. And just a powerful experience of his presence. And my prayers deepened ever since and become more contemplative. And uh, I'm in a very charismatic parish, an African-American. We don't call it charismatic worship, but it is. We're clapping, we're praising God, and the powerful worship and praise of God. All that's just brought my faith powerfully alive, and I've, right. I've really met Jesus. Well, tell, tell us a little bit about, about your parish and what, what you see happening there and anything you feel like yeah. are lessons that other people could learn. Yes, well, as I say, I think the main word to describe our worship in the African-American communities where I've served is expectation. People really come to church expecting to meet the Lord and to hear from Him. They're coming to hear a word that'll change them and to receive the, the, the living God. And, I, you know, I, they're coming expecting an experience, a powerful encounter with God, the Holy Spirit. And He never fails. He never fails. And I think that that's probably the biggest difference. There's just this air of expectation. And it makes everybody be on their game. Our lectors, um, um, you know, our Eucharistic ministers, our ushers, um, of course, we the clergy. Um, it's a powerful expectation. It really keeps me on my game in terms of preaching and preparing my homilies. Um, they expect they, good preaching, don't they? they? Do, yes. And they yeah. want long preaching, don't yeah, they? They don't, right. want to, they don't want to be shortchanged. No, indeed. <laughs> yeah. I, I get a great how, privilege. How long is your service? Well, our, our longest mass, our, the full gospel choir, is two hours. Yeah. And about a half hour sermon in there. So yeah. I get, that's a great luxury for me. Yeah. You're really able to yeah. teach in depth things. Yeah. Yeah. And they've really helped me hone my skills over the years, just, just by support and encouragement, but also expectation. It's really interesting on your blog postings, you oftentimes include a little music video or mm -hmm. yeah. a little something like that, that gives you a little yeah. flavor of... Yeah. That supports what you're what you're. Yeah, as about. a musician, of course, I'm sensitive to music to begin with. But I, I mean, just an incredibly uh, gospel music. Um, I say, I, I think what I find most wonderful about gospel music is the focus is always on God and what God is doing. Hmm. And I'm, I'm I'm afraid that some contemporary Catholic music is a little more too focused on us. Yeah, and we're the we're gathered community. We're, we're building the kingdom yeah. of God. We're you know all that stuff. <laughs> yeah. They, over the years, they sung of they sung of God to me, and they sung of freedom, and they sung of glory, and they sung of strife but liberation in in the yeah. midst. It's a powerful. And that was that was honed in suffering, wasn't it? That mm -hmm. was honed in in tears. Yes. The 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 realities of life and death were brought home through the horrible experience of yeah. slavery and oppression. And there was born a, a profound personal faith yeah. and trust in God, yeah. which is, has lessons for all of us, doesn't it? It does. And the other thing is you'd almost expect if any community had the right to kind of just sing of other people's sins, but they're all, so much of the old spirituals are just saying, help me, Lord, fix me, you know, fix me for my long white robe, you know, uh, help, yeah. you know, just constantly calling all of us to repent. And the eternal and perspective too. Yeah. Yeah, like they, they, they know the shortness of life and they know the, the glory of heaven and they, yeah. they, they, they know how you're supposed to live to end up yeah. there. When I get to heaven, I'm gonna put on my robe and go wear it all over God's heaven. Yeah, yeah great yeah. longing for heaven. Yeah. Now you are telling me before the program began that Actually, you're in a changing neighborhood right now. Yes, and yes, that, that's a challenge. A, Tell us a little bit about that. It is. It's, it's a, a changing a different direction than yeah, a lot of neighborhoods changing. Right. Yeah. It's, it's traditionally African American neighborhood, and now it's becoming uh, almost very dramatically, almost overnight, uh, substantially a, a, a white and maybe mixed, but ma mainly white uh, neighborhood. And that's been a challenge. But thanks be to God, my my parishioners are, are, are adapting, and I. I train them right out of uh, our basic Catholic understanding of the church, which is there's only one church and there's only one pastor in this neighborhood and uh, every single person is, is responsible. We have an obligation to proclaim Christ to them. And um, we have a territory. Every parish has a territory. And whether you live in this territory or not, if this is your parish, we're responsible for every man, woman, and child in this territory and this parish boundary to make sure they've heard of Jesus and have been invited to come to know him. I think he says like 2,000 households in your area, is that right? Or Well, we've actually knocked on the doors of 2,000 oh, homes oh. Uh, in the last four years. Uh, door to door, just knocking and going out in the park and praying with people. And 
Um, so we've done that, but I would say no, we probably got uh, closer to 30,000. We've got a long way to go, but oh, we're going to wow. keep yeah. chipping away yeah. and make sure everybody, everybody. Gets. And you've been hearing some things in those visits, haven't you? What, what you've been hearing, what you do about it? <laughs> well, you know, uh, they said we like the church, we've been there. The liturgy's a little bit too long. Um, <laughs> like the music, but you know. The new population doesn't like two hour liturgies. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. right. So we've heard and we've, we've uh, shortened one, uh, one of our existing masses, but I've opened up a new mass in the evening. I also said they like, because uh, there are a lot of younger adults have moved in and they they say they, they, they like a, an evening liturgy and so we have I advertise it as a, a quiet a, a quiet mass a, a brief quiet mass of the evening hour and even with me at the helm we're out in 45 minutes you know wow. we're done you know wow, and, and that's that impressive. but yeah. I get I get a good chance to preach and, and talk but it's um, it is a little more succinct yeah you're trying to be all things to all people so that some may yeah. be saved yeah that's right. which Amen. is great yeah. yeah that's a lesson other parishes can use just that's right. Watch what's happening to your population and try to try to meet them where they are and bring them to where the Lord wants them to be. Yeah, absolutely. Good. Yeah. Well, I know you've also been very active in the pro-life movement. Uh, in fact, I was just at class yesterday in the seminary. I, I, we, we, your name came up, you know, because a lot of our seminarians oh, have yeah. kind of kind of crash at your parish during the uh, March for Life in sure. Washington, D.C. Sure. Yeah, we uh, yeah we were right up the street from the Capitol, so um, up just uh, you know maybe a dozen blocks or so. So uh, we we pack them in about fifteen twenty seminarians, and uh, they're they're sleeping all over in the dining room everywhere else. But uh, they're uh, they're there, and we um, we do that. And of course, forty days for life that's big in D.C. and playing praying in front of the clinics there, and uh, do also I preach for some of their forty days for life. And one of my great experiences was uh, to be able to preach at the Verizon Center on one of the pro life marches. You mm. know. Uh, talk about, you know, 15,000 screaming young people and just celebrating life. But um, it was a great experience to also, though, really bring home to them. You know, uh, we can't just be joyfully pro-life. We have to make a decision tomorrow and the next day to live chastely, uh, to really work carefully at restoring marriage and family, because yeah. that's where children flourish. Well, I think this leads to an interesting topic. You've just published a book, haven't you? Yes, the it's ten, called the Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments. I don't know. It's amazing. They let you use that title. You yeah, think you've been copyrighted already? You know, type of thing. So we're going to take a short break. All right. Uh, and when we come back, I want you to talk about your new book. Good. Super. Good. Right. After the abortion, I felt no sense of relief. I felt empty, like a part of my soul was just ripped out. I didn't care if I lived or died. I had experienced a rape at a very young age, and I compared it very much to rape feel ashamed. I kept saying to myself, what have I done? Don't do what I did. ID916 is an outreach to young adults to help them become missionary disciples. And we want to build communities of missionary disciples and parishes all around the country. So not only reaching the young adults that are in the pews, but that are outside the churches and help them bring them in and say, let's develop in the parish this community where we can grow together and then we can go together. ID916, it's about making disciples, and it's about molding those disciples, and it's about sending those disciples out. And that's what really ID916 has inspired me to do, is to really preach the gospel, because that's the heart of who I am. The mission of ID916 is to form young adults into intentional disciples of Jesus Christ. And we do that really in two concrete ways. One is through the monthly Disciples Night, and secondly is through the men's and women's smaller discipleship groups. I think the biggest thing is being in a women's group has really helped me. We have formed such an awesome bond over the past year that we've been meeting and really have been able to hold each other accountable and call one another to a higher standard of what it means to live out our faith in our daily life. It's transformational because you go someplace where there, there is um, life with a capital L. It's tough to be married and kind of feel a little bit more isolated and so this has really been a great way to um, live in community together to be encouraged as my role as a woman, as a wife, as a mother, um, to spread that to others as well. Take that step and be vulnerable and join a men's group or a women's group and open up and share your struggles and your triumphs and it's only in that vulnerability and taking the next step where the faith becomes real and it becomes lived out. What's the single most important thing you and I can do to evangelize? Meet him. And 
ID, I have the opportunity to spend time and energy with people who want to direct their whole lives based on their relationship with Christ. The bottom line of what we're trying to do here is really make Jesus known and help people come into a living personal relationship with Christ. After having encountered who I've encountered, my life makes no sense not to talk about him. But when it comes down to it, what we need to do is invest our heart and our time in these brothers and sisters, give them a vision of what God's calling them to, walk with them along the way, show them how to respond to the Lord. The difference with ID916 is it's explicitly focused on growing as a disciple. Our goal is to take ID916 to parishes to help them form communities of missionary disciples with their young adults. We bring ongoing leadership formation on a monthly basis to support the leaders and give them the tools to, to build the church. I just have a burning, like an ache, that people could know him. See me your name. Hey, welcome back. Uh, we're, we're talking to Monsignor Charles Pope, pastor of Holy Comfort of St. Cyprian Parish in Washington, D.C., and we've been hearing his amazing spiritual journey and his work as a pastor right now. And Monsignor Pope, you've just published a book called The Ten Commandments. Yeah. Uh, why did you write a book called The Ten Commandments? I mean, <laughs> isn't that kind of old fashioned? Or, I mean, do those things still really have relevance for people? Everything old is new again, <laughs> every day. But uh, I think that uh, obviously the Ten Commandments um, are at the very, very heart of our moral tradition. The problem is that we, we want to avoid, I think, reductionist notions of the commandments um, as if God's law could be just reduced to 10 simple things. And Jesus, uh, in his moral tradition in the Sermon on the Mount, sort of talked about fulfilling the law, filling it full. What are all the implications, you know, of the commandments for us? And uh, so what I try to do in the book, and this is uncharacteristically brief for me, I, I tend to write longer things, but it's about just 120 pages, but just to really look at some of the implications of each commandment. Um, so for example, you know, we, hopefully most of us haven't murdered anyone yet today. And we might say, well, that, that commandment's taken care of. But of course, as our Lord does in the Sermon on the Mount, he talks about, about so many of the ways that we kill people spiritually, uh, we endanger lives, uh, uh, the, the anger that we let grow in our heart, and so the on. So, yeah. yeah, so what are all the implications of not killing? Um, and uh, just taking each of the commandments with that in mind. And I, I link to the catechism quite substantially because the catechism does that so beautifully. It just shows the, the rich tradition. For example, the, the, the social teachings of the church are very beautifully portrayed under the seventh, you know, the, the, the commandment, I should say, not to steal, you know, and so on. So all of these are just ways of saying that's what I do in the book. Uh, I try to show how we feel full, the full implications of what God is doing but also to avoid a kind of just a list of to-dos because ultimately what the Lord is trying to describe in the whole moral tradition of the Sermon on the Mount and uh, the church has been trying to do is what is the transformed human person like? Mm -hmm. you know, what does it really mean to really love God with all my heart and love my neighbor? And that's, it's, it, there's, there's a, it's the portrait of a person who is just transformed, who has authority over their anger, authority over their sexuality, uh, who is not greedy, but is generous and loves and wants to share and, and be involved. It's a, Sounds it's pretty a person, attractive, doesn't it? Yeah, it's a person yeah, set free. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Free. yeah. Now what, would, what would you say are some of the most neglected commandments right now? Well, you know, of course, obviously in our culture, the most obvious area of struggle is, is in human sexuality. Um, but we also want to, I, th I think another big other uh, underestimated area is greed, um, the insatiable desire for more. Mm -hmm. And uh, even a lot of our sexual struggles in this culture tap into greed. I want what I want when I want it. I don't want anyone to limit my freedom and my, my, my happiness. And so I think one of the more underconfessed sins today is related to the last two commandments, not to covet, you know. Mm -hmm. It's always the other guy that's greedy. You know, I'm never the one who's greedy. It's that guy that earns a dollar more an hour, he's greedy. But he, somewhere we all have to say, listen, when, I can, when can I finally say, you know, I make 100 grand a year. I don't need the other 300. I'll give it away, I'll, I'll, you know, into various good purposes. But almost no one ever thinks that way in our culture. Yeah. And we're always thinking I need more and more. Do you really need the granite countertops? Well, yeah. you know, and so on. So that's a big area. And of course, obviously, another huge area is God has been 
marginalized. The first three commandments yeah. pertain to God, and yeah. you are the to greatest love injustice God. is injustice to God, isn't yes, it? It is. We we think of justice as just a matter of you know horizontal about mm -hmm. relationships on yeah. amongst people, but the greatest injustice is for the creature not to worship God, Amen. not to praise God, not to obey God, not right. to center their life around the one who's given them life and is is God. Amen. And when our when our relationship with God is out of order, every other relationship goes out of order yeah. too. Because as I say, so so much disorder in our culture, the breakup of our families and so on. People don't fear the Lord in, the, in that holy sense. They don't re reverence the truth he's given us. And because of that, every other thing goes into chaos. Yeah. And there's no sense of urgency today yeah. of getting ready to meet God. I want to be ready. I want to look on this beautiful face for the, all, of, all of eternity. And yet we just don't, we just can't endure his holiness if we, if we just continue to dabble in sin. Yeah. We're not ready for him. We, we, we wouldn't be able to endure it. Yeah, yeah, that's where the unpopular but life-giving message of repentance comes in. That's like, right. it's, it's good news to hear that we need to right. repent because the good news is that if you repent and believe mm -hmm. and obey the Lord, you'll be saved. And if you don't, you won't be. Mm -hmm. And so what, what good news to find out the way to salvation, that it's revealed to us, that right. we, can, we can respond to it, yeah. It's in a magnificent, it's the very first word out of Jesus' mouth, isn't it, in his yeah. public ministry, repent. And then of course, believe, believe the good news, believe yeah, because good stuff is coming. Repent, Amen. change your life because yeah. your Father in heaven wants to give you a kingdom. Amen. He wants to give you eternal life. He wants to give you resurrection from the dead. Let him, right. but you need to let go of those other things that you're clinging to as, as false idols in your life. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, we just recently you've been writing on some some social cultural issues, you know, about how there's a divergence happening between American society and, and the church and right. the, the confusion that's resulting. You know, you wrote a little bit about the Al Smith dinner and the mm -hmm. St. Patrick's Day parade and mm -hmm. how there's like ambiguity getting into all those situations mm -hmm. that somehow could be confusing the Catholics. Right. Tell, tell us a little bit about how you see the situation today. Yeah, well, as I say, I think as a church, and I'm going to start with us priests, you know, I can't tell you how many people on my blog tell me, you know, we never hear from our pulpit about abortion or about premarital sex or uh, the question of marriage. And, and it, it, there's just so many things. Um, we as priests... We're being and, intimidated by our culture into shutting up yeah, about things yeah, that our culture doesn't like to right. hear. Yes, and we've got to be clear. We've just, once again, I think clarity is going to be the essential gift we have to give our people. Clarity with charity, but clarity that says, look, there are just some things that we cannot affirm. They are at odds with what God has revealed to us, and we are not free. They're not good for human beings. Yes. We're, we're trying to be merciful yeah. to people who say, if you do this, yeah. it's going to lead to misery in this life and eternal separation from God. But if you repent and believe, mercy is available, grace is available, love is available. Yes. Yeah, I'll quote you. You've said so beautifully. If you don't know the bad news, the good news is no news. <laughs> yeah. And we haven't done a very good job of saying, you know, we're really in need of this. Yeah. I mean, we are lost. And we will, we, 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 in, if we don't turn to God, but we've got to first realize I'm, I'm kind of lost. And then I'll say, now I'm humble enough to ask directions. Yeah. And then... Yeah. God can get me out yeah, of the mess if, if, I'm in. You know, in order to qualify for divine welfare, you have to admit your poverty. Yeah. yeah you have to say, hey, I really am. I really can't do <laughs> this myself. I'm dead in my sins. Yeah, and, yeah. And, I really and, can't uh, <laughs> accomplish eternal life by myself. I really can't live forever right. by my will. Yeah. Uh, it's a gift that, that's being offered that I need right. to accept humbly. Yeah. Yeah, in faith. And I think such an important motivation, you know, is a deep, deep love for God's people that we as clergy and leaders, uh, fathers of families, all of us who lead in the church, parents, yeah. that uh, there are, Satan is after people we love. Yeah, not condemning, yeah. but offering the good news yeah. that deliverance from oppression, deliverance yeah. from slavery, deliverance from mm -hmm. being enslaved to disordered desires is available as possible. Amen. Peace is possible. Joy is possible. Yeah. Right. Freedom is possible. Come and get it. Amen. Amen. That's the, <laughs> yeah. At the end of the day, and it's just recovering that urgency, yeah. um, that there's a, we're all caught up in a great drama, and we're in the middle of the greatest story ever told. Yeah. And uh, we've lost a sense of drama today, that there's a, every decision I make tends in one direction or another. Yeah. Tertium non dator, no third way is given. We're either gonna be moving toward Christ or away from him. Yeah. And our decisions matter, yeah. they matter. Yeah, yeah. Well, I really, I really experienced such a, such a delight 
in uh, having to, to discover you, Monsignor Pope, because as you know, I've been trying to raise the alarm on a lot of these things and filling in the gaps that are being neglected and trying to address issues that are really essential that nobody wants to talk about anymore. And you know, I found in you a real brother in the Lord, a real comrade in arms, you know, the type of thing. And hey, I'm really excited about this new booklet I've written called uh, The Final Confrontation. We're gonna tell you a little bit more about it and how you can get it. When we come back, Monsignor Pope's gonna have some closing words for us. Shortly before John Paul II was elected Pope, he gave this prophetic warning while on a visit to the United States. We are now facing the final confrontation between the church and the anti-church, between the gospel and the anti-gospel, between Christ and the anti-Christ. This prophetic warning was repeated recently by the papal nuncio to the United States as he spoke to all the American bishops. And whether this is the final confrontation or not, we're certainly living in the midst of a tremendous confrontation. In this booklet, I consider what we can learn from scripture about this confrontation and how we can live during it and emerge victorious. To receive your free copy, visit our website at renewalministries.net or call 1-800-282-4789. I think you'll find the booklet I've written very helpful. Well, Senior Pope, uh, yeah, I know you preach every, every day, every Sunday in your parish. How about just a few words to those who are with us today, just whatever's on your heart, maybe even a prayer. Yeah, I, I, I just want to invite everybody to um, get, get to know Jesus Christ. But I, I caution and I warn you because there are many false portraits of Christ. I, I would encourage you to, 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 to get to know the real Jesus, the Jesus of, um, the Jesus of Scripture. Read, read his scriptures, listen to him every day. I get to know the real Christ. There's also a wonderful resource in the catechism. So again, beware, beware. There are false images of Christ, the real Christ. Get to know him. He will save you. He will enter your heart and completely transform your life. And this is his promise to us, that he would remain with us and completely transform us into his image so that uh, we, would, uh, we would die with him. We will have to suffer with him, but we will rise with him to new life and a new glory. So my blessing for everyone would be simply again that you, you come to know the Christ uh, of Scripture, the true Christ, the Word made flesh, the eternal Son of the Father, and His Holy Spirit will live in you and draw you up to eternal glory. Christ will prepare you to meet the Father. And so my, my prayer for all of us is just, Lord Jesus, enter our hearts. Give us every grace, every strength, every mercy. And may your blessing, Jesus, always be upon us. Amen. Amen. Well, Senior Pope, thank you so much for being with us today. And I'd like to encourage all of us to pray for Monsignor Pope and just ask the Holy Spirit to come upon him and mm -hmm. Holy, Holy, what is it, Holy Comforter, St. Cyprian's mm -hmm. Parish in Washington, D.C. Yeah. And also to consider getting his book. It's called The Ten Commandments. It's available at the Renewal Ministries bookstore and many other places as well. Until next week, this is Ralph Martin and Monsignor Pope wishing you the very best, a life of saying yes to Jesus.